don't eat any, any food that comes with a health claim. <laughs> it sounds counterintuitive, but if you're worried about your health, that is not the healthy food. The healthy food is in the produce section. It's sitting there very quietly, uh, without budgets to do this research, without budgets for marketing, without packages to print health claims on. So just kind of tune that out. What do you make of the new agriculture secretary, Tom Vilsack? Well, it's interesting. When, when Vilsack was appointed, I was, uh, I was disappointed initially. And, uh, and I said something like, it was, this was agribusiness as usual. Um, he has surprised me in, in various ways. Um, and I have some reason, uh, cautious, uh, for hope. Um, I think he has a mandate from President Obama to uh, begin reforming things. Um, he has uh, appointed as his number two uh, the, the woman running the Department of Agriculture, Kathleen Merrigan, is a, is a proven reformer. Uh, she developed the organic program in the department uh, and as a staffer to Senator Leahy back in the 90s. And she is a, really committed to sustainable agriculture. This woman will be running the Department of Agriculture. I think that's wonderful. Um, we'll see what she can do. She's up against an incredible amount of opposition. Um, he made an initial move to go after subsidies that was not very well handled and was rebuffed very easily by the agriculture committees in the House and Senate. He, I think, will do a lot to support local uh, agriculture. He's very committed to farmers markets and developing these local food chains, and I think that's very encouraging. Um, but he has a mission to make nutrition uh, the watchword of the nutrition programs in the Department of Agriculture, school lunch, food stamps, WIC. Now that sounds kind of duh, but in fact, those programs have nothing to do with nutrition right now. They're essentially ways to dispose of agricultural surpluses. So if they actually raise the nutrition standards and make that the focus. What do you mean? They're the way to... Well, the reason we, we, we have a school lunch program, um, you know, it began as uh, an effort really to, to get rid of this incredible overproduction of American agriculture. I mean, we're using our children as a disposal for um, excess, you know, cheap ground beef and cheese and uh, all these corn products. Um, and that the, uh, you know, we're under the school lunch program, we feed our kids, you know, chicken nuggets and tater tots in school. We're, we're using the school lunch program to teach them how to become fast food consumers. Uh, so it's not about health, and it needs to be about health. Um, so if he can move that program in that direction, I think that would be wonderful. Michelle Obama's organic Gordon, that the pesticide industry uh, had in a memo that they shuddered when they heard her use the word? Yes. Uh, you know, I think her garden is actually a significant development. I mean, you can dismiss it as symbolic politics, but in fact, symbols are important. And the word organic or fighting words in this, is a fighting word in this, uh, in, this, in this world. And she did not have to say it was an organic garden. She could have simply said, it's a garden. And that she did uh, was noticed. And the Crop Life Association, the trade group of the pesticide makers, wrote her a letter, being as cordial as you must be to a first lady, saying, you know, you're really casting aspersions on industrial agriculture, and we really hope you will use our crop protection products. In other words, buy our poisons whether you need them or not. We're talking to Michael Pollan, his latest book, and now out in paperback in defense of food and Eater's Manifesto. Your words of wisdom, uh, your food for thought, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Yeah, it's very simple. It really is. I mean, you know, as a journalist, you know this, that usually when you drill down into a subject, you find things are more complicated than you thought, and the blacks and whites don't quite work anymore. When it came to nutrition science, the deeper I went, the simpler it got. And by the time I had spent two years studying what we know about nutrition and health, I realized that, it, you know, all that you could dismiss so much of this sketchy science. And as long as you ate real food and not too much of it um, and emphasize plants more than meat in your diet, um, you would be fine. And that the overcomplication of food by industry, by government, um, is something really to be avoided. And so the challenge is, though, how do you identify food? because now the market is full of these edible food-like substances, um, the ones that carry the health claims. The, um, what do you mean, edible food-like substances? Well, these are, these are products of food science. Uh, these are the stuff in the middle of the supermarket, the stuff that doesn't go bad for a year. Um, deathless food, immortal food. Um, you have to think, well, what does it mean to say a food has got a shelf life of six months or a year? It means it has been engineered to resist bacteria, pests of all kinds, fungi, molds, and what does that mean? Well, it has no nutritional value for those things. Um, the insects, the bacteria, they're not interested in the Twinkie because there's nothing of nutritional value in it. Can you talk about how the food system affects health care and the whole issue of health care reform? Well, I think that we are soon to recognize that 
we are not going to be able to reform health care, which depends on getting the cost of health care down without addressing the American diet, the catastrophe, the catastrophe of the American diet. Uh, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, estimates that of the $2 trillion we're spending on health care in this country, $1.5 trillion is for the treatment of preventable chronic disease. Now, that's not all food, because there's you have smoking in there, too, and alcoholism. But the bulk of it is food. Food is implicated in heart disease, which we spend you know, billions and billions on. It's implicated in type 2 diabetes. It's implicated in about 40% of cancers. It's implicated in stroke, all sorts of cardiovascular problems. And um, you know, the, in, a, in a sense, the healthcare crisis is a euphemism for the food crisis. I mean, that they are identical. And I do think that President Obama recognizes this. And I think that you will see programs to um, address this, because that is how you could, you know, a better school lunch program would be a down payment on the health care reform, because you would reduce long term the cost of the system. Treating a, a case of type 2 diabetes costs the city of New York, every new case, $500,000. It is bankrupting the system. How is and it it's treated? preventable. Well, type 2 diabetes is, is once, you, um, once you contract it, it's $13,000 a year in, in additional medical costs. It takes uh, th uh, something like 10 years off of your lifespan. It means an 80% chance of heart, of, of heart disease in your life, a, a, a possibility of amputation and blindness, um, you know, being tethered to machines and drugs your whole life. It's a very serious sentence. And it's entirely preventable with a change in lifestyle. The, the interesting thing is, why don't we have really powerful public interest uh, ad campaigns to inform people about this? I mean, the way the government could save the most money the most easily would be having a, a public advertising campaign about the dangers of soda. Um, there are a great many children that simply by getting off soda avert this whole course. What do you think of taxing soft drinks that they're talking about now? <sighs> You know, I'm not sure, frankly. I haven't really thought that through. It, it's probably not a bad idea. I think that, um, that the cheapness of high fructose corn syrup and sugars in, in our economy is part of the problem. And that when, when we started, subs I guess I would attack it on the other side. We should not be making these corn-based products so cheap with our tax dollars. I think we have to change the subsidies. Um, the reason that soda is so cheap is that we subsidize corn. In, in huge amounts, and I think we have to we have to change the incentives down on the farm. I think that's really where I would put my emphasis. What about uh, large corporations buying up the farmland of poorer countries? Well, this is going on. There's just a, there is a growing recognition that the great unrenewable resource is is arable soil in, in in this world, and that countries like China realize that they will not be able to feed their population on their soil base. Uh, because of their numbers, but also because they poison so much of their soil. Um, their soil is polluted, and they have a serious problem with that. So they are buying up huge swaths of land in Africa. This is a, a political disaster, you know, waiting to happen. I mean, Africans, uh, you know, are going to stand by while their best farmland is being used to feed Chinese. I mean, I, I don't see this as a sustainable solution for anybody. Um, but this is what's happening, and and we should take we should take note and realize that our farmland is so precious, and we should be very careful about developing it, and we should certainly be careful about letting it run off into the Mississippi River because we we're failing to put in cover crops and things like that. We just have 20 seconds left, but you wrote a long letter uh, to President Obama uh, to the farmer in chief, as you put it. What's the most salient point in it? The most salient point is simply you are not going to be able to tackle either the health care crisis or climate change unless you look at our food system. In the case of climate change, food is responsible for about a third of greenhouse gases, the way we're growing food, the way we're processing it, and the way we're eating, and the health care crisis, as I've talked about. So we need to address it. It's, it's really the shadow issue over these other two issues. Michael Pollan, I want to thank you for being with us. His latest book, In Defense of Food, an Eater's Manifesto. It's just come out in paperback. Uh, also his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma and the Botany of Desire. That does it for the broadcast. Mach now is produced by Mike Berkshire, Foto Caduce, Aaron Monte, Angela Comet, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Honey Masood, Robbie Karen, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Laguerra, Peter Curry's our engineer. Special thanks also to Becca Staley. On Saturday, I'll be in Chicago at the Navy Pier for the Green Fest. That's at noon on Saturday. You can check our website, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.